the second speaker of the day. And I'd like to talk about the duality um, or reciprocity. So I'll begin by some vague statement. So, well, I don't mean like by duality, I don't mean something like electromagnetic duality or, well, like even like Poincaré duality. I mean, of course, I mean, they should be like mysteriously related to each other, but here I'm taking the viewpoint of representation theory. So in representation theory, um, you study representations of a given group. So, and this is the study of symmetries, basically represented by this particular group. But what I'm, what I mean by duality is in a situation where you have representations of some other group, and if you're extremely lucky, then you might have some kind of arrow connecting the two different worlds. By this, you can relate one kind of symmetries with the other kind of symmetries. And Usually, this represents a very deep um, facts in mathematics. So, right. And there are some things you might want to expect of such an arrow whenever these things is nice. Well, for, in for instance, well, you should have a bijection of representations from both sides whenever it's defined. Or if bijectivity fails, then it should fail for some reason which we can understand. And in representation theory, you not only classify representations, you study interesting invariant. So if this arrow is nice, then again, you should see some matching of invariants coming from both sides. So, and if we try to study this further, then there is some ideal situation where we can do it very well. Namely, in ideal situation, well, let's call the groups gamma 1 and gamma 2. Somehow, you have a nice mathematical object. Uh, well, whatever, it's a set or vector space or whatever. But coming with some large symmetry, Especially, it should accommodate uh, gamma 1 action and gamma 2 action. Well, usually, it's nice if they commute, but I'll just write them separately. So it comes with actions by gamma 1 and gamma 2. And well, this object should not be too big uh, relative to the two groups. And what you expect is, in an ideal situation, again, well, the way these groups act on this object will basically demonstrate how these are related. So in one sense, well, you can find such a correspondence by finding such a mathematical object. And you can also convince yourself that this arrow is very nice and natural if the mathematical object you found is natural. Okay, okay so th these are extremely vague, I know. So I'll make my points by examples. Um, so first of all, let G be a finite group. And you consider the group algebra of G. And it comes with G cross G action by left and right translations. And it will decompose in terms of irreducible representations of G 
usually decompose as pi dual tensor pi, where these are two actions. So in this case, well, gamma 1 equals gamma 2, but still this arrow is given by uh, the contra gradient construction. And well, this guy is the nice mathematical object we have here. And an example two is if you have a finite dimensional vector space over C, we'll say dimension equals, well, n. You take V tensor k for some non-negative integer. And this object comes with the action of the symmetric group and G of V, which commute with each other. And what we see here is, well, you have irreducible representation of SK and irreducible representation of GLV. So, so this is the vague arrow I stated before. And this is often referred to as sure vial duality. OK. So what are other examples? The third example will be very brief. In the study of quadratic forms or automorphic representations, you study theta series or theta correspondence. And there, I'm not going to define the, even the groups or objects, but there you have the so-called Vey representation or oscillator representation, which come with some certain group actions commuting with each other. And the, this action basically gives you a very nice representation theoretic correspondence. And uh, actually, the Vey representation itself can be constructed as a representation of a metaplectic group, which is a double covering of a usual symplectic group. And example four is if you have mu n, which is like nth roots of unities, then it comes with z mod and z cross action and the Galois action. And they commute with each other. They are even abelian groups. And the way they act on this set actually defines the, your favorite canonical isomorphism between the two groups. And that's the standard statement in this, well, Galois theory for cyclotomic field. So you can think of these as gamma 1 and gamma 2. And this is the mathematical object we are looking for. And well, this example, in this example, we don't quite see representations. These are just the, this is just an isomorphism of groups. But of course, such an isomorphism will induce a bijection and corresponding sets of representations. But if you like, you can reformulate. Uh, in the spirit of representation theory, if you view mu n as a variety over spec q and take cohomology, then that will decompose as the character of. So you just basically dualize the picture. I'm, I'm using fancy language only in anticipation of a more general theory. And here you have representation characters of this Galois group, right? And, and you have a, a very nice bijection induced by this isomorphism. OK, so
And a final example is uh, the case of CM elliptic curves. So now you consider elliptic curves over C with complex multiplication by K, where this is the imaginary quadratic field. So some elliptic curves have well bigger endomorphism algebras than the others, and they are called CM elliptic curves. And it turns out that it comes with the action of the class group of K and the Gala group of the Hilbert class field over K. So Hilbert class field is just the maximal abelian unreified extension. And that's a finite abelian group. And the way they act on this set actually defines a canonical isomorphism again. And if you like, you can dualize the picture to get a representation theoretic bijection. So that was a rather long introduction of about the duality that I have in mind. So let me get to the second part of my talk, and I'll be brief. So for me, well, one of the deepest duality theories or uh, reciprocity laws is the Langlands correspondence. It's an extremely deep and beautiful theory. And well, a natural question is, well, can we study this correspondence in the flavor of these examples? Like you find a nice mathematical object, and then you f define the uh, natural actions of the involved groups. So let me be slightly more precise. Let G be a connected reductive group defined over Q. You can take it to be GLN or some other classical groups if you like. And the question is, can you find a mathematical object equipped with the G action and the Galois action? And well, to be precise, actually, I consider finite Adele, but I don't want to be precise. And the Langlands correspondence, global Langlands correspondence, so this is global, is supposed to be a correspondence between representations of these two groups. And I don't, for experts, I don't want to even mention the hypothetical L group. Um, OK, so, and G. Let's say now it's a connected reductive group over QP. Um, then what we are looking for is some object on which GQP and the Gala group over QP act. Maybe, maybe actually Q and QP can be replaced by their finite extensions, if you like. But basically, what we are looking for is the question marks to study these correspondences. And it seems best answer is this is these are cohomology of or you can disregard cohomology. There are uh, nice objects people have found for Question one is the so-called Shimura varieties. And for question two is uh, Rappaport zinc spaces. Generalizing uh, Lubin Tate spaces or Dreamfeld spaces you have seen in other talks. And in fact, example four and five are baby versions of Shimura varieties. So you, what you're seeing there is the Langlands correspondence for G equals GL1. OK. So I'm near. 
almost done now. Well, so my past work has been revolving around these objects and well, how to well enhance our understanding of the Langlands correspondence by studying these objects. And well, and one of the questions I like to study here is well, when you look at the homology of Rapoport zinc spaces, then uh, actually it comes with three group actions. As I wrote, you have G or GQP and the Galois group. To be precise, it's the V group. And there's some other group. which And the way they are intertwined is, well, these two group actions should be essentially local Langlands correspondence. And between G and J, it's a mixture of the jacquet Langlands correspondence and something else. And this has been studied quite a lot when G equals GLN. But in other cases, there are precise conjectures, but I mean, there are not too many definite results. So it will become very interesting when G is not GLN, when you start to see L packets and endoscopy and so on. So one of the questions I like to study is, well, what this really looks like. I mean, there is a conjecture, so I mean, real question is, can you, can you establish some instances of the conjecture? I'd like to stop here. Thank you. <laughs>